Well, it's finally here. The highly anticipated limited edition Smart Wool and Grateful Dead collection has finally dropped exclusively at smartwool.com. You may know Smart Wool as the go-to brand for all things merino wool, from socks to base layers. Smart Wool has been keeping people comfortable outside for decades with some of the softest and ethically sourced merino wool out there. Well, Smart Wool's limited edition collection and collaboration with the Grateful Dead is back by popular demand right in time for the holidays. From t-shirts and hoodies to beanies and socks, now you can have the next level comfort of Smart Wool with all your favorite iconic Grateful Dead designs. Shop the drop exclusively at smartwool.com and get it before it's gone for good. Gone, gone. Gone for good. That's Smartwool, S M A R T W O O L dot com. Hello and welcome to the Undermine Podcast. I'm Tom Marshall, your host of these proceedings. And we are at episode 30, which means we've plunged deep into our destination of this season, which is the famous Fall 97 tour. And we decided to find an expert to discuss this with us, although not just an expert, mind you. I think we have found the indisputable expert who can tell us what was driving fish to greater and greater heights every night of this tour. And now my co-host today, King of Osiris, RJB. Are you excited about our guest today? And this is something else. We're into Fall 97, and today we get to discuss one of my favorite fish shows of all time, 11 17, And nobody but our guests could do this justice, so we're going to get right into it. Um, if you like what we're doing, please consider supporting our new Osiris Premium offering. You can get all kinds of amazing stuff, and you can support us. And one more thing, we know everyone out there who's been listening and watching has a lot of memories of these Fall 97 shows. We've received a lot of messages asking for people to come on the show, and now we want to hear from you. So send us a video clip of you talking about whatever show you feel like talking about, 60 seconds max. Post them on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Tag Osiris Pod. We're going to choose one of these videos at random, and you will win a handwritten copy of the lyrics to Ghost from my friend Tom Marshall. I hope Uh, I remember the lyrics. I do too. But speaking of Tom, who's our guest today? Oh man. Well, I had this, uh, you know, I've been the whole night. I've been thinking like, how will I introduce this guest? And I think there really is no better way uh, than to just bring him out of the very cold, dark waiting room and uh, just bring him out into the light. And it is, uh, well, look who's in the freezer. It's Uncle Ebenezer himself, Trey Anastasio. Hi, Trey. We've been focusing on 25 remarkable shows from the 90s uh, leading up to this uh, incredible tour, the, the Fall 97 tour. And I was wondering, Trey, you you certainly understand like your tape trading audience who listens to all these shows endlessly. They recognize patterns or changes in the band. And Fall 97 is one of those standout tours where band energy and fan energy was through the roof for so many reasons. But I always wonder, are there eras you look back upon with, with fondness? And if so, is fall 97, one of them? Definitely. Um, um, when you just said fondness, the first thought that I had was that just popped in my head um, was, I mean, I like all the eras. I really liked 92, 93. It doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, Maybe, I don't know. I don't talk to anyone, (laughs) so I wouldn't know if it did. But um, I, so much happened in 1997. um, And we can talk about all that, you know, Um, the, the chain, the, the trajectory of, of life and band changes in from, you know, like, mid 96 till big cypress was just it was like a rocket ship taking off and sometimes i think to myself when when i hear you know i love everything that happened and and it's all part of like a journey but i have to say that i still feel a certain kind of a different kind of um joy and pride when i hear shows from like 1992 i think if, if i remember correctly 
there were some fans that were a little bit quizzical about what was going on in the mid nineties. You know, we had this incredibly tight. We used to practice from 11 o'clock in the morning until six o'clock every single day. I would plan out practice at night. I would write out what we were going to do 15 minutes at the beginning of I mean, it was insane. <laughs> and we had this massive song list already. And a lot of this stuff was, you know, maze, divided sky, like, like really original sounding music. Um, so there was a, a shift that happened, I think. What would you agree with that? Like sort of in the mid to late nineties? Yeah. We were getting we were jammy and looser and all this stuff. Yeah. Ninety-three, ninety-four, really. It's like sort of when it started to shift. And we we talked about this summer ninety-five show, which I don't know if you remember, but it was the middle of summer ninety-five with like a you know, Finger Lakes, you know, fifty minute tweezer that was just I think people were confused. People who'd seen shows in ninety four came back in ninety five and were like, what? <laughs> where, where, where did this go? You know, um, which I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but I think yeah, that's 92 what I'm to 95. To. Yeah. Well, I think when I listened, because you told me what show we were going to talk about, and it was so fun to go back and listen to it. I remembered that there was, a, you know, that there was, you know, you have to set that 97 show up with what came before it and what was happening. So w when we did the, the tweezer that that was um, important for the four band members was the Bangor tweezer. Yeah. Um, I think that was 94. 94. Yeah. So, you know, we had these listening exercises and we, we also had play been playing this incredibly intertwined composed all that early fish from 92 was written with a pencil. You know what I mean? Where the bass and the two hands of the piano and the guitar and even some of the drum hits were composed and, and tongue and groove. It's very complex music. If you listen to all things reconsidered or divided sky or you enjoy myself, or I don't know, all that early stuff, foam, foam is completely composed, start to finish. So what that did was taught the band to be in a mindset where everyone was, was every bass note was harmonized with a, with a going by fast. The guitar note was here and the two hands of the piano made a chord. If you stop the music, <laughs> In the middle of Fluffhead, did it, did it. If you just stopped it, Mike is playing. There's a four note chord being played at any moment in time with the rules of counterpoint. So, all this discipline that came before the jamming in 97. And then, like, sometime around 94, 95, we started talking about okay, let's jam, but let's be the band that listens to each other when we jam, not the band that one guy takes a solo. Let's jam the way we do. That was a, you know, a conscious choice that was happening sometime around 94, 95. There's a way that but, you... But I do remember the audience react, you know, some people like old fans being like, you're losing me here. I don't understand what's happening. And I guess what I'm trying to verbalize at the top of this is that part of my personality agrees with them. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I was so proud of us in 93. We'd walk off stage and I'd be like, we we're playing music that no one else in the world. I've never heard a band play like this before. No yeah. question. No yeah. question. I remember Paige in the fish book about 97 was saying, uh, I think about this show that we're talking about now that uh, we're composing music on stage like uh, I've never heard before. And it, and it filled filled him with delight something you said about this uh about this particular show I, I think about this tour was that you guys had made a rule of no analyzing and i guess that implies that like after each show you would sit around and kind of analyze the show and i'm wondering if um it was that communication uh, like right now if you listen to this tour fans hear an intense communication between the four of you and i'm wondering uh you know four shows into this tour it's so apparent. And is that communication a result of letting go? It's kind of a result of not wanting to argue. <laughs> <laughs> the rule was a response to not wanting to have arguments. So Amazing. because of the amount of time we were spending together, and Tom, you were witness to that. You know, Absolutely. it's still four guys who had been over a decade locked in a car. So we came off stage. Anytime somebody said that wasn't a good show or that was a good show, someone else would immediately respond with, I disagree. <laughs> and there's no right answer. They were both right, you know? 
but but this show, like, and you said you went back to it. This is four shows into this tour that ends up, you know, just being completely amazing the, the whole time. What? How are you guys into this? I don't know if it, you, this occurred to you when you're listening back, but it sounds to me like you're you're all completely locked in from the first note, four shows into a tour. And I feel like for bands that you know, okay. I mean, you were you were touring a lot, but but you, but it wasn't like you had just come from from a tour. You guys had had a little time off, and then suddenly we're like on this rocket ship again okay can i can i do do the no analyzing i'm gonna quasi disagree with you but i'm gonna yes. say yes yes, yes. i love it quasi disagree with you here's what happened in 97 let me back up to 90 this is why i went back to 92 you have to put this in context um in case i'm maybe i'm getting the dates wrong but we recorded the sicket disc in 90 Okay, we recorded the second disc in March or something like that. Tom and I did four fully realized farmhouse sessions where we wrote the entire repertoire, including Story of the Ghost. Twist, I mean, everything we were playing in that era was was written in, set. this is all in one year. I think we played a festival. Great, great went great or something? Went. Like great that. went. Yep. Great yeah. went. This is all in 97. We went to Europe. Twice? Twice, yeah. You're on we Letterman, Europe, you're like on Conan. A, seemingly a week before this tour, we were in Europe doing the Back of the Worm show. We were doing the Sick of Disc, we were doing Farmhouse, we were doing, it, it was insane. But more importantly than any of that, from where I stand, no one in the Fish organization, except for, I'm going to say Tom, who's my pal, but in the direct Fish organization of band members and crew and a management office had children except for me so i got married in the summer of 1994 and my life started to change as we all know when we get married um i had a child suited <laughs> we did in 95 and then in april of 97 i had another child we did and we had a home birth and the way i remember we'll have to fact check these dates but i'm pretty sure this is how it went um, you know, I've got the coolest wife in the world because she was just like, off you go. You know, I got my two children and I'm a hippie in the woods with no nanny or anything like that. Just <laughs> go go off to Europe, which was the back of the worm tour. <laughs> so I felt like I was sort of living two lives, like I was going out and having this explosion of stuff. Um, and then coming home and trying to be super dad, you know, like changing diapers and like, OK, I leave that at the door. And because of the fact that I was the only one who had children, the party was on. Man, it was on. And that's got to be factored into what you're hearing in that show. The party was on. The party was on the bus. The party was after the show. Every night, there were tons of people on that bus. It was packed. And we would finish the show and everyone go on the bus <laughs> and start rolling. And that's what I heard when I listened to it a couple of days ago. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, I remember this. And then kind of these kind of strangely conflicted feelings for me, like about like, okay, you know, uh, kind if of like you ask more questions, I, I can get more into this, but when you really look at everything that happened in 97, I mean, it was nuts, the amount. It wasn't like, yeah. oh, they started this tour and they started off. We, that was part of a continuum. I think we were, I think we were in the studio like around my birthday doing Story of the Ghost, and that's beginning of October and of September, and we were on tour in November, and we were in Europe, and weren't we? Yeah, yeah, February, March, and then and then June, July. So yeah, yeah, those are the Europe tours, and yeah, that all it was so, all yeah, so it's, the whole year was like there wasn't a there wasn't a free day the whole year except for like the day to go home and have the home birth, and then. Come meet Tom, you know, five minutes later in the farmhouse somewhere. It was unbelievable. But that also, like, you know, created this feelings of, like, you know, when you start having children, your whole worldview changes. And the whole flow, you know, that you're hearing, I, that was, I know, for me, part of it, I think. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But that, you know, all of those things sort of conspired. Yeah um to you know it's life changes and they're all they're all the eras are good but but you know you can't when you have two kids at home you can't you know 
the amount of time that was spent developing that 94 repertoire yeah on my part was you know like 12 hours a day i mean i just was writing constantly like a song like it's ice or something like that i would get up in the morning write for you know it took me it took you know i'd write three bar three bars of it's ice took you know, probably two or three hours mm. Mm -hmm. you know perfecting 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 <laughs> always like all day and then once there were kids in the house you're changing diapers it changes you know yeah yeah it changes so <laughs> this is okay this is really i mean this perspective changes my whole my whole like line of thinking about this but you 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 said in the fish book that the areas of risk and safety switched places between 96 and 97 it might be related to to what we were talking about with you know analyzing and um being more i guess open but you know, to me, Fall 97 was the first of many times when I felt like Fish was like this exciting, unpredictable adventure. I was a freshman in college. I saw a bunch of shows and I was there was an air of like fearlessness, I thought, that I'd never heard in music before. And it, granted, this is right when I started seeing live music. But I, I saw this as like every night the lights went down and there was this like fearlessness and dominance, not dominance in a negative way, but just like we're 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 going where we're going and you're coming with us and there's no hesitation. There's no, right. you know, and I, I, I guess, is that about taking risks or is like, how, how does that come to be? Or, or do you even see it like that? Maybe, maybe that's not even your perspective. I do. No, I do. I think it's really, I love what you're saying. I'm listening. I'm, I'm going to do the same thing I just did, which was, let me tell you a story. Yeah. <laughs> when we did Rift, we had been signed to Electra Records. And I walked into the office and I and I, our A and R person, Nancy Jeffries was her name. <laughs> she wouldn't mind me telling the story, I don't think. Uh, she was assigned to be our A and R person. And I walked in with this, you know, the first chair, the first track, you know, rift. Again, which was like this 1993, 92. Yeah. And she hated that record so much. Everyone at the record company, and I had the worst, I'll never forget this. She was like, this is the worst music I've ever heard. I will <laughs> not work this record. And she handed me a Frank Black solo record from the Pixies. The one that's, I remember it. I went home and put it on. The first song was, I want to live in Los Angeles, not the one in Los Angeles. Which I thought was a pretty good line. <laughs> <laughs> but she was like, try to be more like this. You guys are so uncool. We can't work this way. It was a horror show oh, wow. and they never did <laughs> and the way i felt at that moment was you're s fuck you you're so yeah. wrong fuck you yeah. fuck you fuck everybody <laughs> you're so wrong i just couldn't give two shits whatsoever what any of them thought so again I'm just throwing this into the conversation Yeah, <laughs> that I did have a feeling like it or not in 91, 92, 93, 94, when I walked on stage, I had the exact feeling that you just described. Mm -hmm. I am now going to play something you've never heard and you're coming on the journey, whether you like it or not, it's called David Bowie and you're going to dance the whole time. And I'm <laughs> going to go through every single one of the 12 keys in the space of no one's played anything like this before and that's how we felt we walked off with pride then in 94 95 we're like you know let's work on the jamming well after that it's like okay what are we going to contribute to the stream of music so when we kind of started jamming that's what all those listening exercises were about i mean there were conversations in band practice where like i'm not going to jam unless we we got to do something new we've got to jam in a new way and it's got you know and all that work we did led up to you know and i think what was important about that 97 show that we're talking about for the four of us was that again what had just preceded it was looseness risk we were taking risk you know on all through the previous year or two and we had been going into the studio trying to jam sick at disc and trying to be free and open open spirit open spirit open spirit and i for the four of us the ghost during that show I like the tweezer opener too. It was like we were really loose, but you can really hear if you really listen. 
you know, the passing of the baton back and forth, even in the simplicity. I mean, to me, that's kind of what we had been shooting for. So Fish is on the hi-hat and he could just open the hi-hat and I would change what I was playing on the rhythm guitar. And then Paige goes, he's bringing in the synthesizers. And um, it. we, after this show, listened to that ghost on the, on the uh, bus. And it was like the first time we ever could listen to fish, like a live fish show. And, you know, it was a, it was an important show for us in that way, but I'm not saying that it wasn't a bumpy ride. getting there. Uh, incredibly <laughs> bumpy. Yeah. yeah. So the material, the writing and the material and the playing of the shows is always tongue and groove for me, from where I sit in this fabric. Right. So we got to slow down in space. We got to slow down. We're playing all these crazy mental fugues. We got to slow down. Let's go to the farmhouse. What do we write? Twist. Ghost. Bug. Those are all written in the farmhouse in 1997. Olivia's Pool. So many. But those three just think, you know, the, 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 the intent or the feeling, the wave of the feeling was slow down. It's two months later, we're in the studio. Story of the Ghost is the album title and the opening track. It was recorded in 97, came out in, I think, 99, but it started, the recording started in 97. Am I correct? That's what I remember. This yeah. was all part of a conscious effort to be more, to bring an element into the music that was contrary to what we had been doing the previous years, which was kind of fast and, and tongue and groove. Right. Well, let's slow down and get funky. Let's write some funky, slow down funky songs. Let's do a new album. The, the title track is, and then here's the show we're talking about. What song are we talking about? We're talking about Ghost. It was only a couple of months old. Yeah, that makes sense. What, can I ask a quick question just to follow up? Because the way you described the 92, 93, like this, the tongue and groove, the, the just beautiful compositions that were so precise and fast and the the feeling the need to try something different is that just being an artist like does that always happen or or were there other things that made you think like well let's now we need to space things out i mean was it anything besides just feeling like as an artist we don't want to we don't want to get stuck in in what we were what we've been doing I for think so it's long like that's a good point that you just made and and i'm responding to that i think it's kind of like you're working on a piece or I'm working when I'm working on a piece, I'm always thinking this is the greatest thing ever. And then as soon as it's done, I hate it. Like, I just like, Oh my God, I can't believe I thought that was good. You know, I want, I want to try again. Give me another try. It's like that. And then mm. like, this is it. and you're working. And then like, it's like the day of mastering. It's the worst day ever. I'm like, oh, you can't change it anymore. It's like, oh, <laughs> why didn't I, you know, like that kind of thing. So, there's that, but um, and then there's the. I may be veering off your question here, but we need to talk about if we're gonna talk about this show, you you really need to factor in what was going on during that period of time. You know what I mean? I'm going to play you something here, which I think people probably have heard before, but and then I'll explain what you're hearing. <laughs> yeah, what I'm going to play you is the end of the album version of, of Twist, right? So I was going to play you just as one little example of that was this is the album version of Twist. And Paige was doing his, we don't have a control room in the barn. There was such a huge party the whole time, always, that the whole basically recording of Fish album was like, everybody shut up. <laughs> Tell everybody to shut up. You know what I mean? So there was one moment at the end of the Twist where I was like, Bryce, just leave record so we could document this. And this this is it. This is what it sounded like when Fish was recording. This is just him just leaving record on while Paige did his overdub. <laughs> Ninety-nine percent of the time on the bus, what we played was 
James Brown circa 1966 to 1969. Give it up, turn me loose. You know, give it up, turn loose. Bam, bam, boom, doo, 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 doo. We're cranking ear bleeding volumes. We go from that to story of Jack Johnson to Band of Gypsies over and over and over and over again. And on it goes and on it goes right into Colorado 97. We walk in the door and open with the tweezer. Now, to my ear, what you're hearing is just a continuation of the life that we were leading on the bus. And if you really listen closely, because I noticed this right away, check out the bass. Because sometimes when Mike gets going, he plays like lead bass, and he wasn't during that period. He was playing really simple, which is boo doo 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 doo. Give it up, turn me loose. Boo boo doo boo. Boo doo 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 doo. And fish is just doo doo. There you got it. That's that, where it came from. That's a perfect and the time. Comment about you know white guys from Vermont can't play funk. They can't compared <laughs> to that. The real <laughs> funk. <laughs> but we ended up. It just seeped in. It seeped in. The and I guarantee in. you that night we like went right back on the bus and started again. <laughs> no question, no question. And I remember and it, Tom. Uh, you were there. So I was like, lucky to have been there, and time. everyone who was there counts themselves incredibly lucky to have been there because while it was a party, there was also amazing music. You guys were whatever was fueling the party, whatever was fueling the music. It was all just one big, incredible, amazing party which is factored into the history of fish and it's what we're hearing in these shows and uh i think it's time to talk specifically about the music when we return after a short break have you ever wondered what it would feel like if your investments reflected what matters most to you at green future wealth management the advisors specialize in helping clients manifest their values in their financial lives Green Future Wealth Management was founded by certified financial planner practitioner and longtime fan Nick Cantrell, named by Forbes as one of the top next-gen wealth advisors in the country. Whether you are just getting started or have complex investing and financial planning needs, visit them on the web at greenfuturewealth.com. You can sign up for the email list or take the investing values quiz. When you feel ready, schedule a free virtual consultation. In appreciation for the amazing fish community and the incredible work being done by fans across the country, Green Future Wealth Management will be donating 10% of asset management proceeds from new Osiris listener clients to fans for racial equity. Just be sure to mention Osiris when booking your appointment. Create your green future. Securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research Inc, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors Inc. Cambridge and Green Future Wealth are not affiliated. And we're back with our great friend, Trey Anastasio. Trey, uh, when we left for break, you were talking about the party scene and how it kind of uh, influenced or definitely influenced and was part of the music. Yeah. And it's funny when you're on commercial there, I was thinking. So the, 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 what I was just describing, you know, there's this other element where, you know, the four of us, you know, this music that was playing on the bus, you know, we worship this music. Who doesn't? Right. And we were students of it. Yeah. I mean, it definitely was music school and this kind of understanding that, you know, in 96, we shifted full time to arenas. And now we've become, we were always a party band in the sense that we had a party scene around us, and mostly our, our friends. And the friend scene grew and grew and grew. It still feels like that. But it had become this dance party and while it was true that we we're staying up until the sun rose every night i can guarantee you that you know all four of us would be like sidebarring studying why this music worked so well you know and wanting to add that to our repertoire of the more kind of you know um kind of literal or, you know, the, we had sort of explored, you know, like harmony and, but, you know, feel and groove and all that stuff was, had become like increasingly important to us, probably based on what we were viewing while we were playing out in the audience and what people were responding to. And we really did um, play these albums. We would put on albums that were, you know, timeless, 
groove albums and play them with people in front of us and watch what people were responding to. And based on the level of communication and interplay, when you hear the ghost from, from 97, we felt like it was a success. And even though this party was going on, we were work, we were listening to it the next day and asking ourselves, you know, debating, having a healthy band debate about what's working, what isn't. It was always like that. It, it always is, and it's, it remains that way. It dicks the last show that Fish played, the four of us were backstage, still doing it. Still doing it, you know what I mean? And, and there's always been also a, you know, the previous generation of fans is always going to understandably bristle a little bit at the change. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, at least a but, at least a segment a segment of the right? yeah like a I mean, wise in shade now or whatever like you know because i like shade yeah it, yeah but it doesn't sound like <laughs> i saw it again right well, right yeah that's you can still hear i saw it again we'll yeah. play that too don't worry yeah. Yeah. i just got to come to more shows <laughs> yeah so trey this it's very rare that we get to talk about old fish with you so we have to take at least a couple of minutes and just talk about this ghost um before we let you go because the sound, I'm just, I'm curious what you hear when you go back to this, because there are these, like the synths and the effects that I think are just kind of starting to provide more texture in really in 97. I mean, I, I, maybe starting with Remain in Light or around that time, but there's this, like you said, you guys are kind of handing the baton co consistently throughout that jam. And then it just builds to this peak, which is not, it's not like a typical rock peak it's it's just like organic there's a lot of space and it kind of evolves over time that's the way i hear it so it's one of my yeah. favorite passages um of any on like, any live like fish. layer right like yeah. layer of yeah first of all page yeah. started doing everyone sounds incredible on this jam page started opening the door which i think has been the biggest door to fishes continued um um development which is his playing those wa those washy sonic synths i just lo i love it when he does yeah. that i think his synth playing combined with his amazing piano playing is so unique um uh i love the synth playing on sigma oasis on the album just gorgeous yeah I think an evening song. He's doo -doo 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 -doo. it's so cool. And when he, whenever he goes to one in the jams today, like in modern day fish, I'm so excited over that. I'm like, yes. And so are we. It didn't have a lot of effects, but I had, you know, the um I had the whammy with the high octaves and the low. And when I can hear, like whenever a page goes one of those synths, it's just it's like a step into a whole new universe. And so that was hugely influential. I also think. You know, the bass and drumming really developed. And again, I think it's from going to school on the bus. We were going to school basically every night. But if you think about how simply Fish was playing compared to what the way he used to play, he was pretty busy up till that. You know, mm -hmm. on, on that ghost, he's like, it's like he's like leaning into the pulse, leaning into that groove. And Mike is playing these bass lines that are like, on that ghost, if you listen to us, like listen real closely. He's 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 simple and repetitive and meditative, but what he does is he sort of changes one note and it kind of goes to a vague: Are we in major? Are we in minor? Mm. It's not the radical mm. key change that we've been doing like in 2022, mm -hmm. but it's like I'm he's choosing the notes that don't really quite have a key. It's really really cool, like. Doo -doo -doo. Like that kind of thing, like hypnotic and, and and I can really hear on that ghost that everybody is listening intently. Every time somebody makes the tiniest change, everybody else goes with them and it's kind of led by each band member. So those layered things, like sometimes like it's like rhythm guitar and then I go in my mind, like the arpeggios were like, backing up pages synth, mm. like he opened up a and i'm almost like the um the whitewash behind the wave it's mm -hmm. like and then the symbol like ding 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 the 
bellism. I also want to shout out when I heard it. Um, I thought the mix was great. And we could hear each other really well. Uh, there have been various eras of hearing each other on stage is really trickier, as any band will tell you. If you want to play at that level, you go from playing like in a living room to suddenly you're on an arena stage and it's washy and you have to move six inches closer and farther apart. You get to this moment sometimes it's like, I can hear everybody. <sighs> sometimes shout you just shout can't. them out. Shout them out. Who is it? It's Paul. Paul. Right? Yeah. Paul the Great and Bruno. And Bruno, oh, so you guys can like, hear each other on stage. We could hear each other, and Paul was mixing beautifully. Paul was in a real mentality at that point in time of trying to put all the faders at unity gain. Mm. Basically, if you walk behind the soundboard, you would see all the faders were straight across. Right. Good mm. But he would always say to us, <laughs> and Gary says the same thing, by the way. I love this about both of them. Um, they said, when you guys are listening to each other like that, I don't do any mixing at all. I just cross my hands behind my head and lean back. Oh my God. And then they wow. both would say, and you say that you're always listening like that, but you're not. <laughs> and when you're not, it's a shit show because everybody's playing at the same time. <laughs> as soon as one person isn't listening to somebody, it's just white noise. And now I don't know what to do. I have to make a choice. Wow. They both said the same thing. They're like, if when you really are listening to each other, it's easy to mix. Trey, I have a I have a listening question wow. uh, of li of you guys listening to each other on stage, and it's clear that that's going on. You guys are almost mind reading, like how you can jump from one thing to another. But I'm wondering, like, because these grooves sometimes are 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 going on for a long time, is it after a long time that someone makes a suggestion to change, or like, are, in other words, do you sit comfortably in the groove for a while, or is, you know? Because if you change the second something was played differently, those long grooves wouldn't happen. That's so it's not, yeah. So what happens? Like, how does that work? Well, the, the mindset, because of the early listening exercise in the career, right? Meaning in, the, in our life together as friends, the four of us, would be, I'm sitting there and I, the important element to um, the listening exercise is that, you say the word hey out loud when you hear that the other three have settled. So exactly what you were just alluding to, they're not changing anymore. So uh -huh. if I say hey in the exercise and you're still searching, basically what I just told you is I'm not listening to you. Uh -huh. So they, you know right away, okay, you're not listening to me. So I think, and Paige and I talk a lot about this, you know, we're, um, I just put myself back at the last show, which would be dicks. So I'm like sitting there and I'm like, Paige, you know, like I'm, I'm scanning all the time. What's Mike doing? What's Paige doing? What's Mike doing? What's Fish doing? And sometimes what you find is a band member is like off in their own world and you can tell. Right. Um, that's pretty rarely Paige. <laughs> <laughs> it's really I love that guy that's he's amazing always, though he's always like right there <laughs> but so sometimes the change is indicating the other people I'm still with you and the other that's, time the stage awesome. is letting letting you know your hi-hat the bell of your hi-hat is leading this jam right ding ding so i'm just i'm just trying to like that rhythm guitar like is like glued to that bell so, duck, duck. then i hear just out of the corner i have to immediately at that moment what's my page doing what's my page doing i'm focused on the hi-hat immediately like this fast lightning fast it's like whack, whack. And he's like wah, 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 wah. so i go whack, and just whack, no, 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 whack. it's like tell them both i'm listening i'm listening it's almost like, don't get mad at me. I'm listening. <laughs> you so know, and intense. I'm behind you. I'm behind you. I'm always behind. I'm backing you up. Even when I'm like screaming on the guitar, I'm still backing you up. And I think that's what RJ was saying he was hearing. I, I hope so. That would be a lovely thing if that's what you're hearing. Because I, yeah. I want to be the whitewash. Yeah. Page's synthesizer is the boat. And I'm the water ski whitewash. 
when I'm going, well, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's loud, but it's supposed yeah. to be the spray from the, you know, the spray from the water, the, the uh, water skiers turning. Yeah. I mean, that's then, amazing. Yeah. You know, and then as I'm doing it, if Mike kind of goes to this major tonality, then I just have to move, you know, and all of a sudden it's major. And then you're, and then on it goes. Man, I can't believe that you do that and, and there's 20,000 people watching and waiting to see what happens next while you're trying to tell everyone that you're still listening and then decide <laughs> what to actually do in that moment. I mean, you must be, I, I assume it's exhausting, but also exhilarating to do it's that. It's exhilarating. It's <laughs> exhilarating. But it's exhausting if, you, if you're if you flailing. Hmm. There's some Here's level where it gets of- really interesting. This, we've now come full circle. Yeah. You going? I'm going to say. Okay. And Tom will know this. I'm really hard on myself. Like Fish calls it the invisible whip. I don't want people to spend money and go up there and suck. And when it happens, like... I'll like lay awake all night, like berating myself for letting mm. somebody down that spent money on a concert ticket and putting on. So here's where it gets interesting is the risk makes the concert that we, we're all talking about a concert that started off with a one, this an unbelievably spacious tweezer jam in an arena. And I remember, I'm not making this up, reading a horrible review in the paper the next day of that show. <laughs> which I'm not even going to get into, but we used to read bad reviews all the time. Constantly. The record company said our records suck. People magazine said we were the worst band of the year. That was all our first national press. This wasn't like a love fest, but we had to get up there and take the risk, right? Because yeah. if you don't go out, there's nothing interesting that isn't out on the outer edge. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's working to do the 94 style show, you got to do something different now. You have to. If it's working being, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm, I really like, I'm really, I really like the singing on Sigma Oasis. Like for myself, I feel like I finally learned how to be a singer. It took a lot of practice and work, and I, I, I'm really, I'm really happy with it. I really like the vocals on Sigma Oasis. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, we already know how to jam the '97 style, so that's no fun. What else can't we do? <laughs> Let's become really good singers. You see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. It's like I didn't come to fish to see. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta like keep growing. You have to be alive and keep growing. So, what's the next frontier? Dance. <laughs> <laughs> we actually talked about that. Get in there. Okay, dude, Get in there. I got to tell you, the last <laughs> Halloween, we almost did it. <laughs> For Halloween, we we're going to do a boy band. We we're going to be a boy band. And we weren't going to play instruments at all. All we were going to do is dance. All four of us. No oh instruments. Left. Just like Backstreet Boy style dance. Oh my god, that would have been oh, that, that would have been like, fantastic. <laughs> that's amazing. All right, now we know where the next frontier is. <laughs> it's not even in music anymore, ladies and gentlemen. We could do like a backstreet boys, backstreet back. All right, we're like, like dancing around. <laughs> oh my god, Jay, that that brings up in a very a very important point. An incredibly important point. And I know I, I'm looking forward now and I know you're competitive as hell always <laughs> about fish. And, and like, you know, you didn't mention uh, that every single negative. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of negative reviews that you read and how they affect you, but I, I know they really affect you. And I know you're incredibly competitive about the band. And I'm wondering about the, the Harry Styles 15 shows in a row that he played <laughs> at MSG, if that's even a blip on your radar. I mean, that's not a blip. I like Harry. Okay. I saw Harry at MSG. I saw Harry the two shows. I saw Harry the two shows before um, he did the 15 night run. It was good. And one of the things I liked about Harry at the concert was like his, he, he, he for a pop star, I really liked it. I really liked it. For a pop star, 
he wasn't emanating a lot of ego. He was emanating uh, this vibe, vibration that I really liked of inclusiveness and party. And he was like dancing and it's like feet are flying off the ground. He's running around and out, like outwardly, but without the trappings of what a lot of young boy band type, you know, get into this ego thing and it ends up killing them. He doesn't seem to have it. He seems to be, isn't this amazing that we're all in this room? And and I recognize that feeling from that same room. So I, I really loved it, you know. Um, uh, you know, it was more of a like, wow. You've always so, celebrated bands that write their own music. Oh, totally. And you. <laughs> so did you. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't know, no just question. write something. You know what I mean? Like yeah. for, for 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 only because it's gonna die. You can't. This is why King Giz is the greatest band in the world. <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna get that on the mic or not. We got it on the mic. We got it on the mic. That's why. Because now there's a band that's doing it. It makes me so happy. I love them. Love. Uh, how many albums have they come out with in 23 albums in five years? Oh my God. It's intimidating. Like it's into, as a fan to to try and absorb the material and, and wrap your head around it. But that remind you of any other band? Does that remind you anything that you ever said to you about your yeah. favorite band? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my parents asked me why I would have, you know, hundreds of live recordings of the same band. Um, <laughs> uh, those are all my tape covers back there on the wall. I mean... Man, I went to Florist Hills. That show was... I had so much fun. Oh, God, it was so good. It was so good. I feel like we've tapped into the energy source of what undermine what Osiris has been going for for this entire season and so I, w- I want to thank you like from the bottom of my heart that for you coming on right at this point right in the middle of fall 97 which is our goal of this season and and thank you Trey it always means so much to me when when we get to talk like this thank you so much Tom and and I've really enjoyed I've listened to a bunch of them and I've really enjoyed this season thanks and thanks to the listeners and thanks to the Osiris team and and I want to give a quick shout out to Cash or Trade the world's only social network where fans buy sell and trade tickets at face value uh, they're at cashortrade.org remember to review and subscribe wherever you listen or watch goodbye and I'm going to give the mic to Trey for any last words uh, just thank you and anyone listening for joyous what a, what a ride look forward to when 5.0 starts <laughs> <laughs>